Hello, everyone. Good morning. You're welcome to the first episode of the Trade and Development webinar series. My name is Larry Peter Ilusison. I am. I work as executive director of Minera Initiative. So this morning, where we have two speakers, I will be the moderator. Uh, we have two speakers. We have Tani Ola Tayo, um, and I'll just do a brief of um, each of the speakers and Africa Kiza. Unfortunately, um, Africa could not make it, but he has asked uh, Brenda to uh, speak on his behalf. Brenda is Brenda Akakunda. Um, he's a trade and development, trade and investment uh, consultant in Uganda. While Tenio Latayo is a policy advisor uh, with a focus on regional integration issues in Africa. Uh, he has worked on the African continental free trade area and wider trade investment and development policies on the continent. He's currently the trade policy fellow at the Africa Policy Research Institute. Uh, he has also served as the lead of economic intelligence at the Office for Strategic Preparedness and Resilience. He has previously worked as a consultant with Institute for Security Studies, um, Supply Chain Africa, United Nations Development Program, and the West African Think Tank. She has also worked as a senior legislative aide with the Nigerian Senate and a consultant with the Office of the Vice President. And then he recently uh, completed uh, a fellowship at the European Univers University Institute of School of Transnational Governance. So we are happy to have Denny and Brenda on this call today. But to um, give a background, as I said earlier, the trade and webinar, trade and development webinar series is aimed at deepening public understanding of the nexus between free trade and development. Um, we want to discuss the importance of intra-African trade in the context of the African continental free trade area. So once again, you all are welcome to the first um, episode of the Trade and Development webinar series. So I would like us to begin with uh, a simple question, and this will go to uh, Tenny or Brenda, either of you can have it. The question is how important is intra-African trade for the continents for Africa's development? Uh, good afternoon once again. So um, first of all, when you speak about intra-Africa trade, for me, I see that is where our biggest challenge as a continent has always been. While we face a lot of economic challenges, the, the conundrum is that uh, our trade among us, us as Africans has always been low. And that is why you see that for countries like Uganda, about 75% of our exports go to the European Union market. So we have been having a, quite a huge challenge with trading among us ourselves. But secondly is while we have different comparative advantages, we don't see uh, value chains supporting each other. We don't see the backward and forward linkages uh, being created. And, and that uh, has been one of the reasons as to why we continue to see our production capacity so low. If you can take an example of uh, maybe the COVID-19 uh, scenario, we saw that as Africa, most of us had to depend uh, so much on, uh, on the donor support coming in from uh, either the EU or the US. And yet we have probably the capacities uh, to be able to manufacture our own vaccines. But this is something we are not exploiting. Now, when you look at countries that have that capacity like South Africa, the question that we pose is how are we as Uganda benefiting from uh, the strength of the South African market to be able to manufacture our own vaccines? How are we uh, transferring resources, skills, for instance, uh, and technology to be able to support the African market? So with the current economic structure that we have, where we see uh, that it's more of export dependence, we find that 
we are not able to uh, maintain or to keep any of the resources to our own. And two, of course, I think we've always talked about the fact that um, Africa is rich in resources, natural resources. Today we have the African mining vision that speaks about uh, beneficiation from our own resources. But still, we see the same uh, economic structure where we're just exporting raw materials to the European markets and, and, and other markets that are available. And then we are importing processed goods. And with that, we don't see uh, us as Africa building our production capacity. But if, we, if, if we're trading internally uh, within Africa, then there's a likelihood that we're able to maintain the resources on the African continent. And I think for me, maybe when moving forward, Peter, this is uh, a question that maybe the AFCFTA seeks to respond to. So I think that uh, broadly, it's important that uh, we, it, we trade among us ourselves because the most important thing is how best do we create a market uh, that can easily be penetrated because even the EU market that we speak about comes with its own conditionalities, for instance. That uh, in, in East Africa, at a certain time, we have this AGOA with the United States. And then East Africa woke up one day and wanted to add value to its textile, uh, to boost the production capacity of uh, its textile industry. And so one of the conditions was to uh, put a tariff on the, on the imports on secondhand clothes. But the US said that uh, for countries to put on that, then they would also lose out on the benefits that they have under AGOA. So those are some of the conditionalities that we get to see because of these external markets that we have. Probably conditionalities that wouldn't be there if we were uh, trading among us ourselves. So I think that uh, that is maybe just an insight in why it's important that we trade among us ourselves to be able to address uh, some of these challenges. Uh, thank you, Peter. Th thank you so much, Brenda, for um, that extensive one. I, I, I agree with you that um, Africa needs to trade more with it, with ourselves or within uh, the continent. We need to trade more with ourselves. Af African nations need to trade more with ourselves because when I, th when I think of Africa, what comes to mind is, uh, or when I think of regional integration, what comes to mind is the European Union. You see that uh, European, the European nations, the countries in the EU have been able to you know, integrate themselves. And what we see is that the, um, I mean, there's the status that uh, trade within Europe is about 69% compared to what it is in Africa, where it's about 15%. So it's, it means that it is easy to trade for Nigerians to trade with uh, Nigeria to trade with Netherlands, with Belgium, with Germany, than to trade with Uganda and Kenya. You know, and we are close to each other. So, um, Penny, this this is coming to you. Uh, the same question that I put to Brenda: How important is inter-African trade? You know, for development, for the development of this continent. Um, thank you. I think uh, Brenda has covered a lot of the points, and it's really about us trying to correct. Um, the trading systems where we found ourselves in due to things like colonialism. So because of colonialism, African countries started to export commodities and import manufactured goods. And when you export commodities, you're not making a lot of money from that. Um, as one example, if you're exporting cocoa, um, there are not many, many different kinds of cocoa in the, in the world. So it means that you're taking the price of cocoa. So whatever the market is willing to pay for raw cocoa, you have to take it. But if you're exporting chocolate, then you can put your own price on the chocolate because chocolate is more unique and there are many different you know kinds of chocolates different brands different flavors and things like that so the process of taking something from cocoa to chocolate is you know um it's sort of like increasing the value of the good so we decided that you know trading more amongst each other will help us do the thing that we need to do which is to transform our economies or have structural transformation where we can trade higher value goods because higher value goods bring more um, income and resources to us than the lower value goods uh, using the cocoa and the chocolate example. And also it's because, you know, as we know um, now when it comes to poverty in the world and just generally global development, 
uh, Africa, we find ourselves um, constantly falling behind. So some of our colleagues, if I put it that way, that we're also you know, struggling with the economies. Some of them are now doing better, some of them in Asia, in Latin America, but we are still having a lot of problems on our end. And we are saying that instead of us to keep on waiting for the help to come from outside, let's try to do something about it by increasing intra-African in trade. And think about it, if Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Zambia, Zimbabwe, if you're trading more with each other, this is not governments that are trading with each other. Governments don't buy and sell. These are individuals, these are firms. So it means we are putting more money into each other's pockets. So if someone from Togo, I and mean, Togo is a small country, but then they realize that they are open to the entire African market, then it means that they can increase the scale of their production and they can earn more income. And then you can even put them in a better position for global trade. So um, these are some of the reasons really to grow African prosperity through intra-African trade, to increase the, the value of the kinds of goods that we export, to drive industrialization, to drive structural transformation, and just you know, to bring about a better life for us as Africans. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I like how you ended it. I mean, to bring prosperity to um, citizens across the continent. The, the, it was in 2018 that the AU member states uh, signed the establishment of this uh, trade agreement. Of course, we've seen the commitment to ensuring that this agreement succeeds. You know, there's been so much going on, um, and, and, and kudos to you know to the stakeholders pushing it. But it does seem, mm -hmm. or some people think, that um, there's still slow implementation. Uh, with Nigeria, for example. It seems like Nigeria and some of that, not just Nigeria, some countries are dragging their feet. You know, so what, it, it, what do you think are some of the challenges that, you know, that is making uh, some countries unwilling or, you know, or just slow in the implementation of this agreement? Danny, this is back to you. Okay. Um... I think some progress is being made. You know, this is a massive agreement and it's 54 countries, 54 member states at the moment of the SFT. So 54 out of 55 countries on the continent have signed it. And I think you have about 46 or 47 countries that have ratified it. So it means that they're more serious about implementing it. But the thing is the negotiations have not been completed. So you're right that it was, um, I mean, it came into force in 2018 and then it was officially launched in 2021, January. But then we don't have trading under the actual AFCFTA legal instrument yet because the negotiations have not been completed. There's this minimum requirement. It's called the rules of origin negotiations that haven't reached the 90% that they need to reach in order for it to come into force properly. But there's even an interim trading arrangement called the guided trade initiative, where about I think seven or eight countries have been selected um, to begin trading and started since last year. So there has been some transfer of goods from, from Ghana to Kenya, you know, and like that. So some trading is happening, but not under the official AFCFT instrument. And coming to Nigeria, there is a sec and there's an AFCFT sector in Nigeria. Their office is in Bank of Industry, and they're actually you know doing um a lot of work. I think what they've been doing so far is sensitizing um the local economy, so sensitizing SMEs and business people on how to take advantage of the AFCFT. But no one can actually trade under the AFCFT as a legal instrument yet until the negotiations at the continental level have been completed. And Nigeria, as an example, is not part of the guided trade initiative. So in that sense, Nigeria cannot even begin to trade per se. But I can't argue that we are completely ready. We're not. Um, of course, we know the issues that we have at the borders, at the ports um, in Nigeria. It's quite difficult to export your goods out and it's also very expensive. So there's a lot of work that we still need to do there. But there is some progress. Um, and I think the fear now is that we're hoping this momentum is, does not reduce because like we are really taking time for the negotiations to be completed. And some people here and there may be losing interest. But even just this week, uh, this week, I think they finished yesterday, there was a business forum, the first AFCFC business forum in, 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 in Africa. So it's held in Cape Town where they gather business leaders, governments, and just everybody to talk about the AFCFT and the need for investments under the agreement. So there are things happening. A lot of other things have been put in place. Um, but you're right that uh, we do need to move faster at the national level, at the continental level, and also at the regional level. Yeah, thank you on that, Annie. The need for the momentum to not slow. Uh, Brenda, I'm coming to you now with this one. So what, what does the 
AFCFTA mean for what do you think it means for the local business for local businesses? You know, who fear or business entrepreneurs who fear the possibility of increased competition? You know, when when uh, the argument gets into full implementation, Brenda, this is to you. Okay, um, thank you, Peter. I okay. Ultimately, what what uh, the AFCFT poses, and I think it goes back to the question that uh, uh, my colleague just responded to, is when you look at the structuring of the AFCFTA itself, one is that uh, if you've read the AFCFTA or everything that is talked about it, it has taken a market access approach. And this ideally means it has neglected uh, the struggles, the challenges that have continued to impede the African markets. Issues to do with industrialization, for instance. Our industrialization capacities, uh, our value chain capacities, so those are some of the concerns that the AFCFTA does not uh, particularly address. And this definitely poses uh, a huge threat, especially for the local businesses. Because one, we see, uh, for instance, the AFCFTA is talking about liberalization of up to 90% of the third actually 97% of the tariff lines. And even the 3% will later be liberalized. So it's more like 100% liberalization. What this means is that uh, what we have continued to see on our market, the penetration of the big corporations, this is exactly what uh, is going to continue uh, because now we'll see uh, big farmers, for instance, from South Africa, easily penetrating the Ugandan markets or those from Kenya easily penetrating the Ugandan markets. And where does this leave uh, the local manufacturers here in Uganda who do not have um, the same capacity as maybe the big farmers? So definitely this is something that the AFCFTA should have maybe looked into, but it didn't uh, address that. Two is that the trade is 80% uh, dominated by the small and medium enterprises. Yet when you look at um, the AFCFTA in its structuring, it seems to focus, well, it's looking at uh, all parties to be equal. It's looking at all businesses to be equal, which of course is not true because uh, we see there are a lot of unresponded to questions that need to have been addressed first before we speak about even liberalization, which is uh, the key player for the AFCFTA. How do we address maybe aspects of uh, financing mechanisms for these small businesses? This is still unanswered. And uh, this definitely means that the local businesses will continue to suffer from the, uh, the current challenges that they have to do with financing uh, mechanisms. And that means that it gives a, a higher playing ground to the big uh, corporations. Competition, I know there's been... Um, a lot of effort towards addressing the competition, the unfair competition, but still, when you look at say countries like Uganda that do not even have a competition policy, a domestic competition policy, it means that even when it is uh, drafted at the continental level, there's a huge likelihood that uh, the domestic players here will not be able to uh, really uh, have a fair play in the market. So for me, Broadly, I would say the structuring of the AFCFTA leaves the biggest continental question not responded to, and that is where our economic challenges are. How do we address those industrialization aspects? For the local businesses, how do countries, partner states of the AFCFTA, how can they be able to support uh, local, their local production without being affected by the opening up of the markets uh, that the AFCFTA is speaking about? Okay, Brenda, th thank you. Thank you for that. You, you did mention um, the fact that there is a chance that big corporations may, uh, may override you know, uh, smaller businesses who do not have enough uh, financial capacity or produ uh, production capacity. You know, but are there any gains for MSMEs at all? Or do you, are you saying that uh, this is going to be, uh, this is going to affect MSMEs because there are some people believe or it's been said that this will as well is also an opportunity for 
businesses in Uganda, you know, to perhaps um, now have a, a newer market in Nigeria, maybe to export their tea or whatever it is that Uganda has the most, you know, the idea of comparative advantage. You know, are, there, are there some gains as well for MSMEs? Uh, Peter, just to speak about it, and I think uh, it relates to the question that you had initially asked about why aren't we seeing countries already uh, trading under the AFCFTA since, uh, since the, the, the AFCFTA was, was put in place? For me, the biggest thing is the readiness and preparedness for even these MSMEs. For instance, how many of the Ugandan or the East African MSMEs can even be able to access uh, the cross-border trade uh, markets. Most of them are still thinking about trading internally, domestically within their country. So for me, while we say on a large perspective, it looks like this is an opportunity uh, for the MSMEs, I think that there's need to go back and see whether the MSMEs are actually prepared to trade, but also, we, we cannot weigh out the option that yes, uh, there's a likelihood that some will be able to uh, benefit, but that has a lot to do with um, the countries, how the country is arranged, for instance, because I know it's difficult for maybe one MSME to be able to say it is benefiting from the AFCFTA. The biggest opportunity we would see here is MSMEs coming together to be able to trade together, which I think is also something that needs time and, and right now it's not happening. We need to see how, for instance, uh, we group uh, based on our comparative advantages that we're able to uh, access a, a certain market. And uh, there's a controversy. When you look at um, what the regional blocks are providing for at the moment, for instance, Africa, the East African market is already putting in place mechanisms to see that uh, MSMEs or those trading informally can be able to penetrate the ESC market. But we're not seeing that at the AFCFTA happening yet. But lastly, maybe is whenever there is more focus to liberalization, definitely it has a huge implication on the welfare. Because uh, if, if say products are coming in uh, to Uganda and, and I like to put uh, maybe issues to do with vaccines and, and um, yeah, vaccines and, and pharmaceuticals because of the COVID uh, pandemic. When you look at uh, drugs or maybe medicine that we bring in from uh, these big uh, farmers, it will definitely be at a lower cost as opposed to that that has been manufactured in Uganda because we're still struggling with uh, aspects of high cost of doing business with everything that surrounds it, high uh, when it comes to accessing finance. So there are still, there's still a bunch of challenges that we face to be able to grow our production capacity. So when we have an open market, it definitely means that me as a consumer, I'll definitely go for uh, one of those products that I can easily access in terms of uh, the financial implication. And this uh, automatically leaves out the local businesses that are also trying to produce. Yeah, and, and, and of course, opening up the markets, meaning, um, the, the products are coming in cheaply, and then uh, yet for us here, you still have, you, you don't have access to even these, some of these materials that you're required, you're importing them. So it, it, it still remains a challenge uh, that, that needs to be responded to. So on one hand, I think that MSMEs can be able to benefit from the AFCFTA, but then there is a need for more restructuring for how the AFCFTA is, is framed, so that we're able to look at the AFCFTA taking into cooperation the fact that MSMEs dominate the market and their interests or their challenges need to be addressed, uh, even in the, implement, in the designing of the implementation strategy at that particular point before we start the actual trading. Th thank you so much, Brenda. You, you, you've given an extensive uh, response to my question and you, you made uh, quite a, a few interesting points. And I like to, I have a follow up question or questions. So you talked about uh, the readiness of businesses. You said you wonder if businesses are even prepared yet, you know, for 
you to take advantage of ACTA. So the question is, what needs to be done to get African MSMEs ready to take advantage of the trade agreement? Uh, okay. I think what needs to be done is at different levels. And maybe it's important that we start with what needs to be done at the national level. Uh, I think, well, for Uganda, we see this is uh, directly placed under the Ministry of Trade. And we've also seen other actors uh, coming into place. We need uh, to prepare our MSMEs in terms of one, making sure that their goods are up to standard. And I think I saw someone in the chat ask about uh, substandard goods, because that is one of the key challenges that MSMEs face uh, on, the, on the border or, or, or to do cross-border trading. So how do we see uh, entities like uh, Bureau of Standards? So in Uganda, we have been Uganda National Bureau of Standards coming in to support the MSMEs to be able to meet the standard required at the at the at the continental markets, because well, that has been one of the key challenges. And then it goes to uh, qualities as well, quality of uh, that they're able to import. So here we face a challenge where we see um, industrial parks being set up. We see farmers uh, being told, for instance, that we have put up an industry that will, for instance, be able to produce juice. So you have already you have already market uh, for sale of mangoes, and what we continue to see is that these farmers are producing, but they're not getting that actual market for their mangoes. And what we actually see is that such such factories or such industries are importing mangoes that leaves out uh, our 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 local producers here because they are not getting a market. So. While we address issues of standards, because I think that is key in terms of preparedness, also uh, address issues of, of quantity and quality. Because uh, a lot of people share stories about how these are ready markets, but you don't even have the quantity to supply to them. So that goes back to how are we grouping? Because maybe one SME may not be able to do it. And this is a role of government. How do we see government uh, grouping these uh, particular um, MSMEs to be able to work collectively? If say it is uh, in the coffee industry, how do we bring the coffee value chain actors to be able to uh, move as a group supported by government as opposed to maybe just uh, the privatization or the individualization that we continue to see? I think for me, that at the national level is something that needs to be addressed. At the continental level, we need to also look into uh, aspects of financing. And financing for MSMEs continues to be a very huge challenge. Now the AFCFTA, uh, and, and this is a challenge, because the AFCFTA is working in isolation. What we expected to see is the AFCFTA being uh, a package supporting the other African Union uh, tools or mechanisms that are in place. But what we see is the AFCFTA placed somewhere in West Africa and it's just working in isolation without uh, taking into institutions the other, African, um, the other African institutions. But what we would see is maybe a partnership between the African Development Bank with the a, with a AFCFTA to see how we support uh, MSMEs to be able to easily access the credits that is required for them to be able to produce goods that they can be able to uh, uh, sell to the African market. Lastly is we continue to see a lot of obstacles and that is why maybe intra-Africa trade has been low. Obstacles on the African market, competition amongst ourselves. This is happening so much in, uh, in here in, uh, in East Africa where you see Kenya is, is taking its own path as opposed to Uganda, yet we are all in the same regional block. So with these obstacles, I think the AFCFTA needs to go back and address uh, some of the key, some of these key obstacles that make market access a, a huge challenge. Because if the market is, is there and it's already market, then I think 
the local producers, the MSMEs can be able to easily penetrate that market. The dominance of the foreign players uh, within the market. And the biggest question, I think you talked about an issue of competition and maybe I'm the one who responded to it, uh, talking about how the foreign players, there's even a huge likelihood. What we see here in, in, in East Africa is Tanzania sometimes, we have had cases where there's rice that comes in from Pakistan or somewhere in Asia, and it is repackaged, look like an East African product. This is definitely going to manifest within the AFCFTA market, because we, there's a likelihood that we'll see countries uh, bringing in uh, products from foreign players and repackaging them as though they have been produced here. So I think uh, the last thing that needs to be done is look at put strong mechanisms, especially in line with the, maybe the rules of origin, to be sure that we are not just having the foreign players still dominating uh, this particular market, as it has always been, uh, so that we can see maybe a certain change towards that. Well, th thank you, Brenda. Uh, now I want to go to Danny. Uh, Danny, Brenda has uh, mentioned quite a number of points that, uh, that are important to you know, take note of. She did talk about uh, the need for standard, talked about uh, the fear of uh, the lack of preparedness or readiness of local businesses you know, to take advantage of the trade agreement. Um, what, what do you think uh, needs to be done to get local businesses ready to take advantage of the trade agreement? Yeah, Brenda has mentioned it a lot, but I think um, some other things that, I mean, that already happened, but also need to improve is just unpacking the complexity of the AFCFT for local businesses. So local businesses are on many different levels. You have the large firms, so people like Dangote that are already trading across Africa, and they found ways to navigate you know, the transport routes. They found ways to navigate the different um, import export requirements. So those guys are already experienced. But then you have the medium firms, you have the small firms that may not be as experienced. We also have micro firms that who definitely struggle a lot to even trade across borders. And the question is, should they even be trading across borders? Because um, it's quite expensive for them. So getting firms ready is not only about getting the ones that can export, ready to export, but also helping the others plug into the value chains so that even if they're not the ones moving the goods across the borders, they are still supplying something to another person that is moving the goods across the borders. So if there's a small producer of, of fertilizers or maybe of an input that can help with fertilizers or help with producing fertilizers, it's making sure that someone like Dangote uses that person as a supplier. So even though that person cannot trade across borders, they can still benefit from trade through Dangote. Um, so it's really about creating those regional value things to make sure that we're not leaving any segments of the economy behind. And there are the technical issues, so the certifications, the rules of origin um, that has been mentioned, you know, how can you comply with the rules of origin? What are the different um, uh, specifications or rules of origin for different products? Um, and even easing the process of certification. So many trade industries now in Africa, for you to get the rules of, rules of origin, you can apply online. And then sometimes they give you a maximum number of days that they make sure that the process is for you. So, so, um, yeah, just to make sure that that is easy, the information is out there. And then the other thing that um, businesses need is a space for connecting. So there's something that they've created called an AFCFT hub, which is supposed to be like a marketplace between um, buyers and sellers, really. So between firms across the continent. And just to add to what Brenda has said is that, you know, there is some collaboration amongst the African institutions. So for example, the AFGB just gave the AFCFT secretariat, I think $11 million um, last year. Um, to help them increase their staffing. We also have Afrexin Bank that is helping with a $1 billion, $1 billion fund, so $1 billion, where part of the objectives of the fund is also to help build the capacity of businesses to trade under the AFCFT. Of course, the African Union is there bringing their own um, support on board. And then you have a lot of other maybe national agencies and regional agencies. The AFCFT is trying to work with the different regs like ECOWAS, like SADEC, like the EAC, to also bring them into this um, trading agreements because we know that the RECs already had some free trade agreements even before the AFCFTA. So these are the different ways that I think um, businesses can be, can, can be supported to trade under the AFCFTA. 
um, I'm still going to be on the, I mean, with, with those comments, I'm still going to be on the call, but then, uh, you know, just listening. <laughs> I, I, I was going to do a follow-up question there. Then. Uh, okay. you, did talk, you did talk about Rex. Um, I saw a video of Dangote. It was an interview with Mo Ibrahim uh, a few weeks ago, and he was telling Mo Ibrahim that um, he, he, he sounded pessimistic about the trade agreement, uh, and his concern was that let's get the regional economic communities to work first. You know, uh, the RECs have uh, a good trade agreement, ECOWAS, EAC, COMESA, and the like, that, that has not really succeeded, if you can say that. You know, so his concern is that we, we need to get the RECs to work first before we start talking about, uh, you know, a big African market. What do you have to say to that? So the thing is, it's not a zero-sum game. I mean, the people that are managing ECOWAS are not the same people managing the AFFT Secretariat. So there's no reason why um, both lines of, of efforts can't be happening at the same time. And these things take a lot of time. I mean, we agreed that the AFFT was in force since 2018, then it was launched in 2021, but still, you know, it's still trying to get off the ground. So it, it's a long game and we can start even different, different um, lines of effort at the same time. And what I also say is that even though we're still struggling to get the RECs very effective, there's a lot of learning we have still done from the experience with the RECs that the AFCFTA is picking from. So one issue is dispute settlements, linked to what Brenda mentioned. Dispute settlements comes up when um, there are issues trading between two countries. So for example, the repackaging of rice from one country, and then they claim that it's a locally produced item. So if the receiving country wanted to um, take the others to, wanted to take an issue with it, what they will do is that they'll go to the dispute settlement body, which the ASFT has actually created. And when the ASFT created that, they pull some ideas and learning from the RECs, you know, how were disputes settled within ECOWAS, um, how successful was it, what were the failures, and how do we make sure that they have a better experience at the Africa level. In that way, I agree that yes, the RECs are also still struggling to be as effective as possible, but um, we have learned some lessons from them and even their own improvement is still ongoing while the AFCFT is building up. The AFCFT does not replace the RECs, it's built on the RECs. So in ECOWAS where there's already a free trade, the AFCFT does not replace that. The AFCFT just makes it possible that between two RECs that may not have free trade agreements, they can still um, trade under the AFCFT. So my response to Dangote is that it's not a zero sum game. We cannot wait until we finish with the Rex because then we'll be waiting for forever. We just try to do our best on with, with the different initiatives that we can. Yeah. I hope Dangote sees this. Yeah, but um, also before before you uh, um, go, there's a question. Yeah. So one of the attendees asking a question. Uh, says he's saying yeah. that. If we're asking Africa to trade more with itself and that they have to do this, carry out these transactions with the foreign currency, dollar in this case, that um, what, what do we do to resolve this issue if we still have to use dollar to, you know, to, for intra-African trade? This is one of the things that we've actually been making a lot of progress on. So that's why when it comes to the AFCFT, a lot has happened. So something has been created called the Pan-African Payment and Settlement Systems. And this, you know, this initiative, this, um, this process helps Africans pay each other in their own currency. Uh, it's called the PAPS, P-A-P-S-S, -S, and it's also championed by Afrexian Bank. And I think they even piloted it. I think a Nigerian bank may have even piloted it either last year or early this year. So they already realized that there is no way we can be trading with each other in dollars because we are back to square one. In fact, the Secretary General of the AFCFT Secretariat himself, I think he said that we lose about $4 billion to foreign currency transactions in Africa. So the PAPS has been set up and the intention is that the PAPS is going to facilitate payments under the AFCFT. Of course, it's a massive project and there'll be a lot of iteration, so a lot of challenges, but then the important thing is that we stick to the goal, to the objective, and we make sure that um, even as we we make sure that we learn from our mistakes and that we always um, course correct when we need to. Uh, and I encourage everyone to just also, you know, learn more about what is happening, what is going on, because, you know, it involves all of us um, that are African. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Brenda, Thank you. Um, yeah. this, this is coming to you now, Brenda. You know, most African countries, there's the issue of, there's the issue that concerns that most African countries have mainly depended on 
you know, producing and exporting commodities and low value products and services. How can the AFCFTA enhance or you know, help export diversification and industrialization in Africa? Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, first of all, uh, and, and just to add on what um, colleague was talking about, I think by this time we have um, ironed out one thing, the fact that as Africa we are wrongly integrated, and that is why we continue to see um, a lot of these challenges that we face uh, on the African market. So I think for us to be able to enhance uh, our export diversification and industrialization, one, it has to be uh, to look into how we strengthen our value, our regional value chains. That is a key player uh, if we're to be able to respond to any of the existing challenges. When you look at countries like Ghana, uh, that are the leading producer of cocoa, yet uh, on a chocolate industry of about 100 plus billion, and Ghana is only getting about 2 billion, you look at Liberia being the largest producer of, of uh, rubber, yet Liberia can't even uh, produce just one wheel tire. You look at even countries like us, Uganda, who I think are the leading exporters now of coffee, yet we're not getting a fair share. That shows you how we are wrongly integrated and how we are not able to uh, acquire as much as we could. So. I think if we to be able to enhance our export diversification, we need to first address those economic challenges. We need to uh, see how best we can um, integrate mm -hmm. our economic system to see that we're getting fair, a fair share from our, our markets. Uh, the other thing that I think we can uh, look into mm -hmm. is our, our fiscal policies. And this is something that maybe when we speak trade, we, we usually ignore. But when you look at, uh, for instance, our contribution of trade uh, to the GDP or our contribution uh, of tax, actually of tax to the GDP, at the African level, it is still so low. And um, I don't know, I have a friend who shared that a lot of us believe that um, tariffs, uh, tariffs, tariffs uh, don't play a key significance uh, to our economies. And that is every, why every time we sign a trade agreement, the first thing that we're talking about is uh, maybe uh, reducing uh, some of the tariffs. But maybe we need to go back into uh, questioning whether it actually is a response, whether we are not uh, losing out, uh, out a lot uh, in terms of trying to be able to get um, the market. Lastly, is it, it's in line with investment. I think our biggest challenge here uh, is how are we integrated when it comes to investment? And this goes to the AFCFT itself. Who, what we would expect is that um, our domestic policies when it comes say, to investments act as a blueprint uh, to what the AFCFT is providing. But when you look at the integration within our region of our investment policies, it still uh, remains as a huge challenge because one, our investment policies focus more on uh, attracting investments as opposed to promoting inclusive development. So that itself leaves a challenge. So the only way we can be able to uh, address our export uh, challenges and diversify our exports uh, is if we get to first understand some of the challenges that affect our exports. We're we actually exporting, but the biggest question or the challenge that remains is we're not getting a fair share. And that's why I've given you an example of Ghana and Liberia and Uganda, that we need to see how best we can address those particular challenges. And we've already given one of the answers, that is boosting uh, trade amongst ourselves, intra-Africa trade. So it is a uh, look at the MSMEs. How do we support them to see that we remove those obstacles that are existing and the barriers that uh, hinder trade? 
and then we can be able to uh, address uh, those particular challenges. In, in, in response to the question of industrialization, I think it goes back to how are we uh, putting in place mechanisms to grow our industrialization. For instance, I know that most of the African countries at the moment, inclusive of Uganda, do not even have an industrialization policy. And where does that uh, leave, leave us as a country? Two, where do we see our, our comparative advantage when it comes to industrialization? For instance, uh, in Uganda, we speak so much about agro-industrialization. But when you look at the budgetary allocation, to, ag to boosting agro-industrialization, they are also still low. So it means we're not uh, putting a lot of support in terms of fiscal and budgetary support to see us boosting our industrialization uh, capacity. And that of course also leaves a challenge. Th th thank you, Brenda, for that uh, comprehensive one. Someone is asking, someone has the question in, in the chat box and I want to ask you, Brenda, uh, I remember Tenny talked about um, the PAPPS, the Pan-African uh, Payment Settlement System, you know, that the pre exim Bank and the African Union are, are working on to ensure that we do not have to use uh, dollar to, uh, to carry our transactions uh, within uh, for intra-African trade. So he's asking that, do we need a singular, do we not, or do we need a singular currency to uh, you know, to, to have a whole and whole, a wholesome financial uh, system for inter-African trade. What do you think? Do we need a singular African currency? That has been a question that has, I think, lived for so long, even be, before the AFCFTA. And this is a challenge we have in East Africa. We've talked so much about singular currency, but when you look at the value of the currency, Say for the Ugandan uh, shilling and the Kenyan shilling, there's a huge difference. So how do we first address uh, that existing gap? Because I think today it would be unfair to speak about a singular currency within the ESC itself, where there's a lot of uh, differences in the value of our currency. So that remains as a challenge. But two is, uh, in terms of a singular currency, there's already an effort. So here in, uh, in, in East Africa, there's already a discussion going on uh, towards a mon monetary union. And one of the things being discussed under that is uh, how we come up with a single uh, bank and also a singular currency. I know that it's difficult. Uh, for me, I would think that right now, what we need to see is how do we address the challenges uh, within the value of our currency. And I think before we address that, then uh, it will continue to be very difficult. That's why um, Kenya, and, and I quote Kenya because maybe it's the strongest economy within East Africa. Kenya has always had uh, a lot of challenges with the entire East Africa. And a lot of times Kenya has been sued for violating the variable geometry because one of the excuses Kenya gives is it is, for instance, not an LDC. So it does not uh, benefit from, uh, from some of the benefits that countries like Uganda or maybe Burundi have. So those are the same questions or challenges that Kenya will raise to you when you speak about uh, coming up with a singular currency. But I think if it was possible, then maybe it is a good idea, but we need to look at whether we have uh, the same capacity as Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa to speak about uh, coming up with a singular currency. I think we still have a lot of time before we can maybe have that particular discussion towards the singular currency. I'm going to now take this um, one question to, to Brenda again. Um, in all that you have said, we have an agreement, or I believe you've convinced me, and I believe that to enhance uh, intra African trade, we need more investment. This could be domestic or foreign investment. So how can, and, and you know, you also mentioned earlier that uh, doing the cost of doing business in Uganda is, is high. And so it is in Nigeria that I know of, and many other African countries, you know, the cost of doing business is high. The, you know, the, 
the process of starting or registering a business is cumbersome, you know, um, and there are a lot of uh, troubles, you know, with uh, macro macroeconomic policies on the continent that that does not make it easy for uh, some of African nations to attract investment. So the question is, how can African countries create a sustainable business environment, the kind of business environment that attracts the kind of investment that we need for the African continental free trade area to thrive? So the question of investment is one of those things that I love to speak about because for a long time, investment has been my area of interest. Now, I, I already talked about the fact that um, how the investment landscape is, uh, is, is as of now in, in Africa, is that we're looking, and just like you posed the question, we're looking so much at how can we be able to um, attract more investments. That is why you see countries go an extra mile, put a lot of incentives, um, try to make sure the law is so soft. But the biggest thing that continues to be uh, unresponded to is how do we create inclusive development? Now that remains a challenge. I, I think that we have the capacity to attract investment because yes, we have the natural resources, we have the resources, we have the land. And, and so attracting investments has not always been a huge challenge, but the biggest uh, challenge that we face and why we don't see a fair share of these investments is these investments are more about um, profit making and that's all. We don't have a discussion around how they can contribute to the inclusive development of the continent or of the host countries. So this is, uh, and, and, and in line with the AFCFTA, this is what I think. When you look at the designing of the AFCFTA investment protocol, it still takes the same extractive model uh, that we have seen in almost all the investment agreements that exist. Speaking about investments coming in, uh, giving them incentives, not taking any step towards addressing issues like performance requirements, skills transfer, technology transfer. When you speak about dispute settlement, it still remains a huge challenge because uh, as, as exists in most of the investment agreements, we see that uh, this remains to be uh, settled in maybe the international courts or international arbitration centers. These are still not responded to in the AFCFTA. So for me, my worry is not uh, whether we will be able to attract the investments that we need to be able to transform our economies. But the biggest challenge is what kind of investments are we having uh, within uh, our continent? And like I mentioned earlier, we, we ought to see our policies acting as blueprints. But when you look at domestic investment policies, I think except for South Africa, most of them, you're not going to find any clause that speaks about economic, social, and cultural rights, things to do with labor rights, human rights, um, and also the, the due diligence performance requirements. So when all those are lacking, what we continue to see is investors, especially foreign investors coming into place, benefiting from all the incentives that exist in terms of tax incentives, the land that is awarded to them and all those. And at the end of the day, we see expatriation of the profit that they make. So still that doesn't in any way contribute to the growth of our economies. So for me, that remains a challenge. And if you ask me for maybe um, a recommendation towards that, I think it would go back to how we are designing these investment policies. Even the investment protocol that we have just uh, designed at the AFCFTA, there's need for us to see how we advance inclusive development as opposed to just attracting the investments. How do we see that under the AFCFTA, investments that are coming into place are contributing towards supporting the local industries that are existing here? How do we, for instance, uh, create a discussion about joint ventures between the foreign players and the local players that are here within our countries? That way, 
we can be able to achieve um, the ultimate objective of the AFCFTA, which is structure transformation. But if it is just an open market, anyone coming into the market, getting as much resources as they require, and then at the end of their tax holiday, they are able to just pull out their profits and take it back to their economies, then I think we're still losing. And maybe we need to uh, get back to, uh, to the drawing table and see how best we can restructure that. We're having a huge challenge of date. And this date now is coming in uh, in terms of uh, either PPPs or maybe in terms of investments where we see someone coming in, they construct a huge hospital, but this is in form of a date that is given to you. And then there are a lot of conditionalities that are attached or maybe roads. The Chinese companies are literally taking over the let me say East African because I'm not sure about maybe what's happening in West Africa. And at the end of the day, we hear that countries have been unable to pay. And then uh, these projects have to be taken back by these Chinese uh, companies or, the, or China itself as a country. So that definitely means that we continue to face the economic challenges that we have. We don't have them responded to because if we're having these projects being put up, but with all these conditionalities that are attached to them, then it doesn't change our existing investment landscape. I think the biggest benefit is if we speak about investment that uh, speaks towards inclusive development and sustainable development. Thank you for that comprehensive response. I agree with you that we need to review mm -hmm. our investment policies you know, to ensure that um, we are not just being taken advantage of all the time and not, you know, uh, going into agreements or creating policies that does not benefit uh, our nation, the citizens and our business environment. Uh, we are coming to the end of this, uh, this episode of Trade and Development Webinar Series. It's been um, an interesting conversation um, um, with Tenny and Brenda. Tenny, I don't know if Tenny is, uh, is available to say something before we wrap it up. Uh, someone in, in, in the chat box is talking about, but I think Danny spoke to that earlier on, um, asking about, uh, you know, the, with the restriction of movement and trade, you know, can we say that um, the African Union or headquarters has failed? Well, um, to just repeat what then how Danny responded to that, he said that it's not a zero sum game. That the same the people who are you know in, in charge of headquarters are not the same people who are in charge of uh, the AFTA, and that you know both um, both initiatives can uh, work you know um, independent independent of each other, and especially that you know, the Irish, the regional economic communities, uh, the AFTA will help in cases where. Uh, countries in ECOWAS want to trade with countries in the SADC or EAC. You know? So uh, it's not that entirely, we cannot say entirely that the African Union and ECOWAS has failed, even though ECOWAS may not have lived up to the expectations. Our hope and belief is that the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, if well implemented, if we keep this momentum, will uh, bring prosperity to Africa. So um, please, do we have any questions, any more questions? If you want to uh, contribute, you can put on your video and say something. Okay, so quickly, I would just like to uh, raise an issue. Uh, I mean, aside uh, issues related to tariffs, uh, which we have talked about a lot on uh, investments, uh, I think one very important thing is also non-tariff barriers, uh, as well as the difficulty in moving around the continent for Africans. Uh, many times it's even easier for people from Europe and North America to visit certain uh, African countries. Uh, and it's difficult for Africans, we Africans ourselves, to you know, visit one another's country. This is really a big problem. And I see it injuring uh, the, the potentials of the uh, continental free trade agreement. So um, I'd like to put this to our speakers. What do you think we need to do uh, as, as uh, civil society players or otherwise? Uh, to push our countries to take decisions uh, from, you know, from an even better perspective to ensure that uh, we see to you know, improving the free movement of people across the continent so that that can facilitate through. 
Uh, that's, that's a question I have for the speakers. All right. Um, and just before I do, I'd like to also mention, I, I mean, I saw the chat, the yeah. comment in the chat about ECOWAS. It's because of ECOWAS's efforts that, for example, I can get up, you know, today in Nigeria, in Abuja, and catch a flight to Ghana this afternoon um, without needing a visa. So as an ECOWAS resident, um, I have I have the right to, I mean, to an extent, to enter in an ECOWAS country for up to 90 days. So it's good that even as we criticize some of these agencies and as we want them to improve, but we also acknowledge the progress that they have made. Um, this free movement within ECOWAS, because the, the question now is on free movement on the African level. So before we even get to free movement on, on the African level, we should recognize what we've done at the regional level. We have free movement within ECOWAS to an extent. Um, it does work um, to an extent. Um, of course, challenges here and there. And then we try to build on these efforts, but we also try to cause correct to get challenges. Now to the question, the EFCFT had an accompanying protocol called the Freedom of Move the Free Movement of Persons Protocol. So it's a protocol for the free movement of persons and establishments and rights of residents. It has a long way. And the idea was that the EFCFT is trying to provide for the free movement of goods and then the FMP which is a free movement of persons protocol, was trying to provide for the free movement of persons because goods don't usually move on their own. You know, they usually, you know, sometimes people that are taking them from one place to the other. So when you have a driver of a truck that is carrying goods, uh, maybe the goods have an ASFT passport and they can cross the border, but the driver himself um, or herself is not able to cross the border because of some visa issues, then you're back to square one. But we know that the issue of movement within Africa is a political one. So I think some countries have signed, about 30 countries have signed the protocol, but only four countries have ratified it. And that's not up to the minimum um, number of ratifications that is needed for it to come into force. So what we need there is more advocacy. Because you know, when it comes to the African Union level negotiations, it's often our heads of state. So in our case, uh, Buhari, in Ghana's case, Akwado, uh, Mama Kosa, Makisao, they are the ones that are usually there, you know, um, having these discussions. And then for the AFF, you have the Council of Ministers of Trade, you have the trade negotiators. But then these negotiations and these discussions don't often involve the people. So I feel like if more people, so more regular African citizens knew that there was a free movement of persons um, protocol, um, they may get interested in it. And then they can push their governments to move past down. So, for example, Nigeria hasn't ratified the protocol. If more Nigerians knew that there's actually an A instrument that's trying to provide for um, visa-free access for Africans within Africa, then they may put some more pressure on their yeah. leaders to say, okay, why haven't we ratified this thing? We need to move fast down. So that's one thing that I, that I think is missing, you know, um, not enough awareness or knowledge at the, the level of um, African civilians, of the people, in a way that, you know, can push them to apply pressure or demand on their leaders that can even move these protocols forward so that we're not stuck um, on certain levels. So yeah, very right that we need um, easier movements of persons uh, within Africa. There is a protocol that provides for that. It hasn't received a lot of political will. And one way to try to address that challenge is to um, use people power, you know, to drive that political will so that we can move faster. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much for that response. The need for us to advocate and use the people power. You know, if we are not in the know, if we do not know about this development, we would not be able to ask or even advocate for, or, you know, use our, our power as a people. So it is good that we're having this conversation, you know, to help more people understand and um, know about this development. Please, if you have, we are, we are, we are about to wrap up in a couple of minutes. If you have any question, contribution, you can put on your video, put on your camera rather, and uh, ask please. Okay, very quick uh, interventions. Um, a very interesting conversation. And uh, one of the things that's been uh, a subject of thought for me since the whole ESA CFT uh, conversation uh, is the fact that uh, sometimes we have not sit down to also begin thinking around the issues of uh, the cross-border crimes that will be a huge issue to uh, the progress of ACFT, especially the movement of goods and peoples across the borders. 
Uh, I want to give a typical example. If you look at the the Sahel, the the borders around around the Sahel region, you would know that this has become one of the paramount um, arms trade routes for uh, for many of the militias from Libya down to the other part of the Sahel region, and it's one huge issue that I think it's going to be very very. Uh, very, very problematic to the actualization of ACFTA. So if in advocating for ACFTA, it's also very important for us to also begin thinking around strengthening security issues around the, uh, uh, along the border areas within the African regions, like inter-country uh, security collaborations to strengthen the security mechanisms within this border area. Because if this is not done, there is no way for example, we are saying Nigeria have not ratified or Nigeria have not signed or perhaps given assent to this particular protocol. But we should also know that we have a huge issues around Boko Haram that we are dealing with, that arms are pouring from Libya, coming in from France and other parts of the world into Nigeria via this particular uh, border areas al along the Sahel region. So on the side that countries have not ratified, we we need to also begin to look at what are the inherent issues, the national security issues or other national issues that these countries are dealing with that may also militate against their giving assent to this particular protocol. So, so when we put all of this together, it will go a long way in actually getting to a conclusive end. But if we're looking at it from one particular side of it, I think it's something that we may not really achieve a very great result. So we need to put that into consideration, like dealing with the security issues along the border areas, which is something that I think really, really needs to be done to enhance the, the to, to speed the, the, the level of implementation of the ACFT. That's just what I want to just think quickly. Th thank you so much. That's a, that's a brilliant submission. I think I read an article that Denny published around you know, the, the need for security to, you know, to achieve. Do you want to say a line or two about that? Um, yes, and um, Arma is right that the issue of security is one of the main reasons that countries have put forward for not ratifying uh, the FMP. Uh, but the thing about the FMP and the thing about immigration or cross-border movement is that the FMP doesn't say that you remove border posts. So it's not yet, I mean, eventually, I think Africa will like to get to the EU um, level of things where you can cross from one EU country to another and you may not see a single, you know, immigration official. You just enter, um, you just enter without even it being on record anyway. But that's not what um, is going to happen at the moment. You're still going to have screening at the border and at the end of it, it's still up to countries or up to their discretion to let you in or not. Uh, so the FMP is not just going to, you know, it's not, and I think that's also what's happening with countries because they, they imagine it as a situation where they just have to throw their gates open and then everyone will rush in. No, that's not what it's saying. It's kind of, it doesn't even apply to informal movement. It's formal movement. So people that are on a database somewhere, people that have a passport, people that have records. But that being said, um, you're very right that um, cross-border uh, crime you know, um, cross border uh, illicit uh, trade. So, like the trafficking of arms, um, illegal movements across borders. I mean, it's one of the reasons why Nigeria closed its border some years ago, where they said there was smuggling across the borders. They're very right that those issues have to be addressed. But the truth is that the part to address that lies with the nation state itself. You know, when things enter and a country's border borders illegally, it's usually because some of their own officials. Um, were corrupt or corrupted, and they allowed that to happen. So it's not necessarily the African Union's responsibility to come and strengthen security at the borders. It's for countries to begin to build that up. And again, it's having a gradualist approach to some of these things, because even those that have gone farther than us still have some of these problems. When the problem comes up, they innovate a new way um, to try to address the problem while still moving forward. So, I mean, in conclusion with that point, yes, we need to address the issue of crime across borders or people moving across borders for, for bad things. In the case of um, across borders, the truth is that Nigeria hasn't been a bigger problem to the region versus the region to Nigeria because it was Nigeria's uh, difficulty with Hambin Boko Haram that allowed it to spill over to Niger, Chad, Cameroon and creating a problem for them 
um, in, in the ways that in the ways that it did. And the last thing I'll say here is that this issue of insecurity, uh, violence, extremism, you know, the movement of of guns, of weapons, it's also linked to economic development. So there was a recent study by the UNDP that said that um, many of the people that joined Boko Haram said that they did so for economic reasons. So the question is, if they had been able to get better jobs, would they have joined a violent extremism? And how can you help people get better jobs also through trade? Because when you trade or you grow your economy, you create more job opportunities, you have more factories producing things, and then you can absorb some of your labor force to reduce the amount of people that feel like they don't have um, a lot of other options versus crime or criminality. So I see trade as the solution, as one of the solutions to insecurity, while also acknowledging that trade or uh, trade flows and even the flows of people can contribute to insecurity. But we cannot wait for one before we do the other because the solution also lies in trade. Yeah. Th- thank you for that response, uh, Dennis. Well said. Pami, I see your I see your hands out. We have just uh, this will be the last question or contribution we can take. So, Tammy, please. Yeah, um, so hello, everyone. I just have uh, a question or a question and a contribution. What she said, particularly about um, economic um, reasons, uh, one of the reasons why financial um, crime is prominent um, within the boundaries. I think that is very true. And I also think we need to understand that um, use of physical currencies like cash is uh, a great enabler for cross-boundary um, um, illicit activities. So the purchase of um, guns and other um, weapons to commit crime, it's, it's easily done because of cash. So if African countries can easily migrate to a more digital currency structure, which then you can observe what transactions are taking place and how they are taking place, it will sort of meet the crime rates. It, it won't solve it, but it would limit it. Um, my question is, oh, my questions are rather, do you think the REECs have a more prominent role to play for African integration more than, so it should, rather than it being a top-down approach from the AU down to the countries, should it be more regional than to the AU? And, um, and that's because the regional communities, they have similar business um, systems, similar almost similar political ideologies and almost similar languages. So it's, isn't it more sensible to have a bottom-down approach rather than a top-down approach? And also the agenda 2063 of the African Union, where it say have the continent that we deserve or we want or we envisage. Do you think the 10 steps set out by the African Union, that is for the free movements of trade and services and to creating the African Central Bank to movements of goods and people. And then, you know, do you think the the, the timeline is very feasible considering that it's taking forever for, although it's pretty quick compared to other um, trade, um, trade, um, trade agreements like that in the EU, uh, in the EU. But it's taking forever for the for the for after to be implemented and for it to be operational. I think it's currently eight countries that are operating under after. Do you think the timelines are feasible? Okay. Uh, hmm. I mean, under Agenda 2063, uh, there's a question of how old some of us are going to be <laughs> at that time. Mm-hmm. I I think that the AFCFT is just one of the projects on that Agenda 2063. So there are lots of other projects happening. And I remember um, Brenda mentioned earlier that oh, the Secretariat is in Ghana, the African Union is in Addis. I mean, it's partly because of that, because the African Union already has a lot on its plate. So before the Secretariat was established in, in Accra, the AFCFT was being managed by a directorate under the African Union. But then they figured out that, you know, this needs a lot of capacity. And then they created a separate Secretariat. So all of the other... Um, objectives on the agenda 2063, silencing the guns and youth and security, you know, gender, they are ongoing um, to the extent that they can. Uh, when it comes to the timelines, I guess the best way to figure out whether the timeline is feasible or not is to check to what extent they have met the milestones that they expected to meet at this point, um, which you would probably see that a lot of those milestones have not been met yet. Uh, I, I think it's it's better to look at it that way than looking at the AFCFT because AFCFT is just one of several projects. So I think they have a review coming up 
I don't know if it's this year or maybe they just did a review not too long ago. And I know that they do feel like um, they're falling behind, but there is still time. I mean, the thing is, even as we are slowly struggling towards this African development issue, the world is also changing. Look at what has come up now with um, artificial intelligence, you know, and are we asking ourselves a question in what ways can this um, even help us move faster on some objectives because, <laughs> you know, we shouldn't also get left behind, still struggling to be developed by 2063. Well, maybe by 2063, um, cars are flying um, in other parts of the world. So that's what I'd say about the timeline. Um, it's not, a, it's not, the AFCFT has an implementation period of 10 to 13 years. That's even share liberalization of tariffs. And after that, we still have a long time before we see some of the benefits of some of the gains from trade that we expect. So let that process be ongoing, but then you can look at the other ones. There was something else you mentioned about digitalization, and it's very important. I know that there's been some discussion about this as well at different levels. Um, you know, so it's something that we definitely ought to embrace, but also while taking into consideration the uh, current capacity levels. So my own uh, position usually when it comes to issues like that is that we, yes, embrace digitalization, but make sure they are carrying everyone along. So it should not become another barrier that will block out um, some people from being able to participate um, in trade in different ways. So whether it's that you need to build their own capacity, or that you need to start from a particular level, or that you need to make many different options available, um, it will be good to just always make sure that technology is not displacing people, but rather um, helping people in the ways that um, that's you know, that can, ha that can happen. And I guess as my own final comment, since we are we're wrapping up, I'd say that, you know, I am a supporter of the AFCFTA, I'm a supporter of African development. I'm in no way um, under any illusions that everything is perfect, or that things are going as expected. But what I try to do is that I try to criticize constructively, so see some of the challenges and then put forward, you know, recommendations, you know, in terms of how they can be fixed. So when I identify a problem, I tell myself, you know, since I'm a full human being, let me also figure out how this problem can possibly be solved. So, and I think that we should all, you know, do that because we all have many different ideas, perspectives when it comes to some of these uh, regional projects. Oh, sorry, there was another question I, I didn't answer. The thing about the wrecks. Yes, the wrecks are closer to the countries and it makes sense that um, integration is driven through them, but that is already happening. And that's what I want to stress. It's already happening. Um, the RECs are already at the forefront of integration within Africa. The AFCFTA is just another layer on top of the RECs. It cannot replace the RECs in any way. Um, and with that, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for this discussion. Yeah. Daniel, uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I also call on Brenda to uh, give our final words as we wrap up on this call. Brenda. Okay, uh, so I think I think all the questions, I think my colleague really did justice to them. So I don't have to speak about any of those, but maybe in line with the timelines, I also um, think that uh, there is need for more time if we are to be able to meet uh, all the aspirations of the AU and the AFCFTA particularly. But it also creates an opportunity because the AFCFTA provides for review after five years. So I think in probably in two years now, they, there's going to be a review. And I think most of the issues that we've been talking about here, this creates an opportunity for us to see, hey, how do we get into a discussion uh, towards uh, reforming or having the AFCFTA as a tool towards addressing the economic challenges as opposed to maybe just taking a market approach uh, market access approach that it has taken. But I just want to thank you for this opportunity. I just started to step in for my colleague Africa who was unable to make it. And uh, I can only say to you, Peter, that I think maybe we need more of these discussions, uh, even amongst ourselves to be able to understand some of the aspects of the AFCFTA because there's been a lot of praise about it and uh, assurances, but we also need to interrogate uh, some of these particular aspects through which maybe we need to iron out so that uh, we can ultimately achieve the structural transformation that we require. Thank you very much. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of this conversation. And I look forward to more of these conversations. 
All right, thank you for being on this uh, discussion on this webinar today. Thank you so much, uh, Tenela Tayo. And thank you everyone for you know, coming around uh, to this conversation today. Uh, this is the first in a, in a series of monthly webinars that we'll be having on trade and economic liberalization. So around this time next month, we'll be having a second edition and this will go on uh, monthly uh, for the next six months. So you will see notifications about, uh, you will receive emails about the next edition. And uh, I hope you can make our time to attend. So thank you, thank you everyone once again for attending. Uh, we have come to an end to the end of this uh, discussion today. Thank you very much.